Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen What comes to mind when you think of the word parasite? For me, I think of an infectious microorganism that is dwelling somewhere in your body that is feeding off you until it cripples your existence. Well, have you ever thought of ideas as parasites infecting our mind? Dr. Gad Saad has written a book on this very topic titled The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. And I think he is the perfect person to have done so, as he is an evolutionary psychologist who has spent many years researching and publishing with a specific interest in marketing and consumer behavior. And there are few intellectual minds in Canada who have such a reach and a following as that of Dr. Gad Saad. Between his blog and his YouTube channel, he has garnered over 26 million views. He's also known as the Gad Father. Well, I'm pleased to welcome to CounterPoint today, Dr. Gad Saad. Dr. Saad, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Oh, well, nice to be with you. Thank you. So firstly, congratulations on publishing your fourth book, and we'll get into that in, in one moment. But could you please explain to our viewers who may be unfamiliar, what exactly is an evolutionary psychologist? Right. Great first question. So an evolutionary psychologist is basically someone who applies the framework of evolution to study the evolution of the human mind. So for most people, it's perfectly natural to study our pancreas or our kidneys or our lungs via an evolutionary lens because we're asking how did that organ evolve to be of that form. Of course, applying it to the human mind, sometimes people get upset because they don't like to think that our minds are shaped by the same evolutionary forces that shape all other life forms. So the evol evolutionary psychologist is simply applying evolution to study the most important organ of our of our of our bodies, which is our mind. Absolutely. Okay. So, what compels someone to get into this line of work? Like, what what attracted you to it? Because I don't know many evolutionary psychologists. In fact, you may be the only one I know. Right. So, when I first uh, entered the doctoral program at Cornell University, I I hate to say it now, it's 1990, 31 years ago. Oh my goodness. Uh, I had taken an advanced social psychology course with a professor uh, by the name of Dennis Regan. And about halfway through the course, he assigned a book titled Homicide, actually written by two of the pioneers of evolution psychology who, who were Canadian-based at uh, McMaster University. And in the book, they look at patterns of criminality via an evolutionary lens. In other words, they show that some crimes occur in exactly the same form, irrespective of culture, irrespective of time period, because they are driven by a biological mechanism. And this is when I had my epiphany. I found it so powerful in terms of its explanatory you know, parsimony that I decided to then apply evolutionary psychology to study consumer behavior, which was the field that I was interested in. Okay, very good. Now, uh, you're an active prof at uh, Concordia University, right? So you're on campus, you've seen many things, you're pretty outspoken on issues concerning free speech, free expression, and uh, the tyranny of political correctness, etc. How have things changed or developed in these areas, uh, specifically that you've observed at universities or, or at large? Right. So I first witnessed it, so in a sense it was nice that your first couple of questions, because I first began noticing it as an evolutionary psychologist trying to Darwinize the behavioral sciences. I'm housed in a business school, and so it was very strange for people to hear someone talking about the, you know, how do you study entrepreneurship via evolutionary lens or uh, managerial psychology or organizational behavior or, in my case, mm -hmm. consumer behavior. And so at first, I would get a lot of, uh, you know, resistance from fellow academics who thought that the application of biology to study human behavior was heretical. Uh, but then that original sort of uh, forbidden knowledge made its way to every nook and cranny of the university. So it, it has only ramped up from the first instantiations that I saw a few years ago. Okay, and, and okay, so say since a few years ago, we routinely hear, we commonly hear of, of students being, you know, persecuted on campus and, and having their freedoms infringed upon. And I think the first time I've ever heard you speak, which was about four years ago, I recall you were addressing the plight of, of academics on campus and, 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 having, and their freedoms and how they are, are being infringed upon. What is the climate for professors in this regard? I think the, the, the greatest tragedy is that most engage in self-censorship. So they are actually at the, the conference that you, sp you spoke of at, at the, the Manning uh, event. I had, if you remember, read a bunch of first person testimonials that were sent to me from professors, from students, and in some cases from parents of students, where 
literally, if you read those emails, you would think that they were describing a reality in Yemen or Saudi Arabia or North Korea or China. But no, these were all from, you know, regular run of the mill universities right. in North America. OK, I'm just, just so the- Dr. Sun, just one second. I'm, we got to run to commercial, but when we get back, we'll pick it right up. Stick around. Welcome back. We're having an excellent discussion with Dr. Gad Saad and discussing his new book, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. Just before we cut to commercial, Dr. Saad, we were discussing, uh, I guess, the the state of affairs for professors on campus. And yes, I do recall that a few years ago when I heard you speak, you did share many testimonials. And I think that's interesting you caught you uh, compared to an experience perhaps someone would have in Saudi Arabia or Yemen. Exactly. And the reason why I, I read those testimonials is because nothing is as powerful as a poignant story that you're sharing, right? I mean, I could I could speak about in the abstract the experiences that I've gone through as an academic for 27 plus years, but to actually read the words that some 21-year-old student wrote. So I'll give you an example. I'm paraphrasing. I don't have the exact quote of mine, but let's say someone writes to me and says, I am working in a cognitive neuroscience lab with Professor So-and-so. And he found out that I posted something that was complimentary of Trump. And he decided to remove my name from a paper that I've been working on for two years. And now it looks like I need to go to another place to study. Hey, are you taking graduate students, Dr. Saad? And wow. I'm thinking, is it is it not unbelievable that a student has to actually write to me because his supervisor found out that he said something complimentary about Donald Trump? But that's the reality that we live in. So I think the greatest scourge it's not so much that people are getting canceled, is that people live in an environment where they are free, they are afraid of uttering a single syllable that would then cause them to be canceled. That's not the way you want to build universities with free, free, free exchange of ideas. No, and I agree with you. And, and we're going to get more into uh, your book in a moment. But given what you said before, that the uh, biggest concern is the engagement of self-censorship. So, for example, this student didn't self-censor and he spoke freely on, I guess, a private opinion forum, and then got called out and canceled, essentially. So when the stakes are that high, and now the student's got to up and leave, perhaps, to a new university and start up from scratch, it's two years gone. How do you justify or how do you encourage people not to self-censor when the cancel culture is so aggressive? Yeah, I mean, it's going to sound as though I'm being uh, flippant, but I'm not. So I, in chapter eight of the book, which I guess we'll talk about in a second, I talk about activate your inner honey badger. And the reason why I mentioned the honey badger is because the honey badger is a animal that's the size of a small dog, and yet it can withstand an attack of six adult lions because it is ferocious, it is fierce, it is so intimidating Hmm. that adult lions are afraid of it. Well, you need to be an ideological honey badger, meaning that if you have ideas that you can support on first principles that are well articulated, you should never back down. Now, the reason why I said, oh, some people might think that's flippant because then they'll typically come back and say, oh, but you're a famous professor, you're protected by tenure. Well, tenure didn't protect me from the million death threats that I that I would receive. Tenure didn't protect me from all the opportunities that I have lost because I am so outspoken. So we all have a cross right. to bear. The people who landed on Normandy uh, 75 plus years ago didn't have guaranteed safe passage. They knew they were going to be mowed down like little mosquitoes by Nazi machine guns, and yet they did it so that you and I can have this conversation today. So yes, there are costs to bear, but if everybody stands up together in unison and speaks out, we will resolve this problem by next Tuesday. If we don't, it'll be a long, long ride to hell. Wow, well said. Uh, Okay, so that leads us to your book. So what compelled you to write this book? So I I basically, uh, in in the first chapter, I talk about two great wars that I have faced. The first great war was as a Lebanese Jew in Lebanon, growing up in Lebanon, where the civil war broke out. And I saw what a society that is organized according identity politic lines, what it can descend into. And the second great war that I experienced was 40 plus years later as a professor, where I saw the war on reason, on science, on evidence-based thinking, on common sense, on logic. And so I wrote this book because I simply needed to document, if you'd like, not only the disease, right? So there's the COVID pandemic, but there's the global pandemic of the human mind that's been festering on university campuses for 40, 50 years. And so I wanted to document that epidemic and then to offer hopefully a vaccine or an inoculation against these idea pathogens. Well, I guess if we're not getting vaccines for COVID fast enough, then I 
<laughs> Perhaps we can help inoculate against this uh, alleged uh, concern. Well said. <laughs> there we go. Um, so you meant you refer to ideas as uh, like as pathogenic like creatures. Can you expand upon that in the forty five seconds we have left? Oh, okay. Forty five is going to be tough. So uh, as an evolutionary psychologist, what I often do is look at an other animals to compare to the human reality, and so I stumbled on a field called neuroparasitology, where you study how parasites go to an organism's brain and alter its behavior to suit its purposes. And so I had found the perfect framework to then uh, analogize what idea pathogens can do to human brains. They lead us to the abyss of infinite lunacy. How was that for 45 seconds? <laughs> that, was, that was very good. You still left 10 to spare. But what we're going to do is we're going to cut for commercial right now, and we're going to return, and I want you to expand further on that idea if you may. Stick around. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion with Dr. Gad Saad, professor at Concordia University, who has recently authored the book, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. So we're discussing these infectious ideas. Uh, again, before we went for a break, Dr. Saad, you were explaining how ideas are like pathogens, uh, pathogenic creatures, and, you know, can take over the mind and infect the mind. Uh, so I guess my next question is, well, which ideas then are harmful? So because they're, they're good pathogens, bad pathogens, which ones are the good ones? So I, I list a whole panoply of such idea pathogens. Uh, I'll start with probably the granddaddy of all idea pathogens, postmodernism. So postmodernism is what I call intellectual terrorism because it purports that there are no universals. There are no objective truths. Everything is shackled by the constraints of subjectivity, of relativity, of personal biases. Now, in some small way, there's a kernel of truth to that. But in a, in a grander epistemological sense, scientists do wake up every day under the presumption that there are universal truths to be discovered, right? An evolutionary psychologist wakes up thinking that there is a innate human nature that unites us under our shared biological heritage. Mm -hmm. So to, to teach students for 40, 50 years that there are no objective truths is really a form of nihilism, if not, as I say, intellectual terrorism. So that would be one idea pathogen. Another one might be, for example, social constructivism, the idea that everything that we are is only due to social construction. We are not, we're born tabula rasa, and it's only socialization that makes us who we eventually become. Again, that starts off under a noble premise, which is, hey, we all have equal potentiality to be whatever we can be. I could be the next Michael Jordan. I could be the next Albert Einstein. Boy, that's so lovely. But the reality is complete nonsense. We are born with different abilities. We are born with biological imperatives. And so each of these idea pathogens, in a sense, share one thing in common. They all try to free us from the pesky shackles of reality. So they are, in a sense, a form of terrorism against reality. It's a negation of reality. Now, you mentioned your experience with identity politics uh, growing up in Lebanon and having to leave as a refugee here to Canada and... Uh... How, so how does identity politics, how does that fit into, into you know, idea pathogens? Would that be considered one as well? Well, identity politics is an idea pathogen because it basically takes one of the fundamental foundational values that makes our society great, which is to uh, place individual dignity at the apex of all values. Mm -hmm. And it instead negates my, my worth as an individual. And it only views me through the prism of some tribe that I belong to, right? So I'm not God sad with all of my merits and flaws, but rather I am a Lebanese Jew. I am a Jew of color. I'm a war refugee. So I have to belong to a tribe first, and that subsumes my personal identity. Now, Lebanon was a society that was completely organized around identity politics. In the case of Lebanon, it's based on which religious uh, you know, a heritage you belong mm -hmm. to. As a matter of fact, the constitution of Lebanon assigns political positions as a function of your religion. The prime minister has to be of this religion. The president has to be of that religion. There has to be this many people in the parliament of that religion and that religion. And so you see when you have an entire society organized along the prism of religion, it eventually down the line leads to chaos. And so to me, it's disheartening to see now the West adopting that reflex of identity politics as a progressive value. Nothing could be less progressive than that. Individual dignity is the whole game. Now, I, I've had this discussion with uh, some peers, and 
you know, I've had this pushback against me. They said, well, identity politics is, has always been around and it's not abnormal for people to uh, form associations or identities with groups that, in which they personally identify. So what's so wrong with that? I, I'm going to ask you this question. Sure, look, uh, my identity, my, I'm a Lebanese Jew, is part of my identity. But when I present myself to the world, I am God sad. In other words, the, so I am a multi-attribute construct made up of many subparts, one of which is my religious heritage, my ethnic heritage, uh, my skin color, but they are incredibly less important than my individual personhood. So nobody is negating the fact that we all have complex multifactorial identities, but you don't place that as something above your individual worth, right? So when I judge someone, so I may have a lot more in common with a an Islamic cleric who shares my secular enlightened values, as I do, by the way, Imam Tawhidi is a good friend of mine, and he's, a, he's an Orthodox Muslim cleric. I may share more things with him than I do with an Orthodox Jew who you would think is part of my tribe. So in other words, I judge belongingness to a tribe based on foundational values rather than on immutable traits. Yeah, that's it's a very... Um, good way to put that. I, I always try to explain to my friends and, and political friends that uh, I always like to come together on issues and values, uh, not on, you know, this identification or the other. Anyhow, we're going to pick up this discussion right when we return from this commercial break. Welcome back. We're finishing up our discussion with Dr. Gad Saad. Uh, Dr. Saad, we've had a fascinating discussion so far uh, discussing your book. In your book, you refer to something called collective Munchausen syndrome by proxy. You know, to us lay people out here, please explain what that is. So the idea came to me, uh, I had written a, a scientific paper in a medical journal in 2010, uh, looking at the Darwinian roots of Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So Munchausen syndrome is when someone feigns an illness so that they can garner empathy and sympathy. Yes, I have Munchhausen children who do this, by the way. <laughs> Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where you take someone under your care, your elderly parent, your pet, but typically your biological child, you harm them so that you can garner the empathy and sympathy by proxy. So mm. it's a truly diabolical psychiatric disorder. And so because I had written the scientific paper more than 10 years ago, and I started seeing the orgiastic full victimhood that people were signaling to the world every minute of every day, I coined the term collective Munchausen by proxy. So for example, Elizabeth Warren, when she pretends that she is a native Indian, what is she doing? She is usurping the, the true victimology of a peoples by proxy, by, 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 by surfing on the vic historical victimhood of another. Jussie Smollett manufactures a victimhood story because it becomes now the most important currency by which you could ascend the social hierarchy. It's not enough that you make $1 million per episode. I need to be a victim. And if I'm not a victim, I will construct a story of victimhood. I will fake one. And so I referred to this collective malady as collective Munchausen and collective Munchausen by proxy. Okay, uh, very interesting. Uh you also refer to another syndrome called ostrich, and this is your own cre your own uh, coining, and you should trademark it if you haven't already, ostrich parasitic syndrome. Yeah, so here I'm, I'm referring to the idea that the metaphor of the ostrich burying its head so that it can deny the possibility of a reality that exists outside of its myopic uh, you know, lens. Uh, parasitic, because as I said, parasites cause us to engage in deleterious behaviors. And so ostrich parasitic syndrome is the reflex to deny realities that are as clear as the existence of the sun. So for example, if you have 35,000 plus terror attacks in 70 plus countries since 9-11 alone committed by a single religion, and in every instance, the people who commit those terror acts tell you that it's due to their religion. They are on record. They have a public taping where they say it's due to their religious teachings. Then some, uh, you know, nuanced thinker from the West says, no, 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 it must be due to lack of art exposure. It must be due to climate change. It must be due to British imperialism. It must be due to beard bullying. So, there so they will generate an endless number of hallucinatory idiotic reasons so that they don't actually take seriously what the terrorists are telling you themselves why they're doing it. Well, that's called ostrich parasitic syndrome. So why would someone do that? Why would someone ignore what they see in front of themselves, in front of their faces? Yeah. So it depends which reality they're trying to avoid. So uh, in, in this case, 
they genuinely believe, they meaning the, the people who are engaging in ostrich parasitics at all, they genuinely believe that to attack or critique a religion is the height of being bigoted. And therefore, they would contort themselves in endless you know, mental gymnastics so that they can somehow protect the noble people of color. But there's nothing more racist than than doing exactly that, right? In the same way that you are perfectly free to criticize my Jewish heritage on on solid grounds, I accept it. I understand that in a free society, you're welcome to not like the Jewish faith. By which logic am I not allowed to point to the fact that there is a statistical regularity when it comes to terror attacks around the world? And it's not usually extremist Jains that are doing it. And to say so doesn't make you bigoted. It makes you someone that has a functioning brain. Okay, in the 40 seconds we have left, uh, how do we help um, inoculate our mind, if you will, uh, against these infectious ideas? Well, in 40 segments, all I can say is read the parasitic mind for a longer discussion. But what I can tell you is you have to develop the reflex to believe in the principles that you hold. Most people are terribly cowardly. So if I simply go boo, they retreat into a fetal position and they suck their thumb. You have to be a honey badger so that we can defend our wonderful values in the West. Take it from someone who comes from the Middle East. We should be defending these wonderful societies that we live in. And where can people get your book? Uh, on Amazon, uh, all over the place. Uh, it shouldn't be hard to find the parasitic mind. I hope you'll check it out. Thank you very much for your time today. Great talking to you. Cheers. Fascinating concept and discussion with Canada's own Dr. Gad Saad. Going forward, perhaps we'll all be more vigilant to protect ourselves from a parasitic mind. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.